I would recommend people just start. Um, do a little bit of research on the platform that you think is best. If you really vibe with LinkedIn, go with that. If you think it's Facebook, if you think it's Instagram, it doesn't matter if, they're, if they've been in business for two minutes or two years or 20 years. Um, they all come back to the same kind of strategy basics, the building blocks of their business. Welcome to the Be Better broadcast. We are joined today with Mr. Nick McGraw. He is a return guest and friend to the Be Better broadcast. You may have tuned in and saw his episode back in March of last year. And if you don't know Nick, Nick is a brand designer and the founder of McGrawsome Design. He helps entrepreneurs and businesses build awesome brands that actually stand out. Nick works closely with his clients to create brands that get seen, are heard, and most importantly, are remembered. And it's great to have Nick back on the show with us here today to talk about what it looks like to build a strong personal brand in today's world in 2023. Things have changed, and we're going to talk about what that looks like. You know the deal. When you take away even just one strategy, one piece of advice, one philosophy, anything that helps you from the broadcast today, please share this show with just one other person who could use it as well. You're the reason the broadcast has grown over the past two years with nearly 300 episodes because you are the best part of the Be Better family. Without further ado, let's talk to the man of the hour, Mr. (laughs) Nick McGraw. Nick, great to have you, brother. Brandon, thanks for having me again, buddy. It's been too long. I know. Long time no see. Hey, real quick, brother. What's what's new in your world? What's what's new this past year? What stands out the most? Um, there's lots of new things. Um, I moved location uh, since uh, we last talked. I used to be like pretty much, I won't say downtown Toronto. It definitely wasn't the core, um, but uh, downtown enough. Um, I was in Toronto. And uh, for my non-Ontario, non-Canadian friends, actually not many Canadians even know this, just north of Toronto is basically our cottage country, right? And so um, that's where all the city slickers, if you will, they have cottages, lakes, they do all their canoeing and stuff like that. They take off uh, to, uh, you know, basically what is basically an hour and a half north of Toronto. Um, and, uh, and that's where they spend a lot of their time in the summer and even in the fall and the winter. Um, and that's cottage country for them. But a lot of people also just live up here permanently. Um, and so now I live up here too. Um, there was a business opportunity uh, that my fiance wanted to go after. Um, and luckily for me, I'm, I'm basically, I'm not a digital nomad, but I can be. And so I wasn't a variable. And I said, hey, if that's what you want to do, she's running the business full time now. Um, and so I can just work from anywhere as long as I have Wi-Fi, right? You, you understand entrepreneurship and business ownership right so it's a brick and mortar location and i'm co-owner of it and i help whenever i can when i'm not running this digital thing uh of mcgrossom but um yeah that's been exciting taking on that business and a brick and mortar business comes with its own very very hyper specific set of challenges that i'm sure everyone listening to this right now who has half a business or invested in a business going yep i know Mm -hmm. yep they don't tell you that in business school what it's like to run your own like coffee shop or a gym or whatever yeah. Um, but uh, but yeah, that's new to us for sure. And that's actually been about a year. Um, just after we did our last episode, we took ownership of that thing. And so, Huge. We've, uh, yeah, we've had that for about a year now. Um, and uh, and I've been living up here as well, um, doing my digital thing. And like I said, I'm not a variable. As long as I have Wi-Fi, I can work in the North Pole. Right. So um, <laughs> so I wasn't I definitely wasn't a variable with that. So it's there's a lot there's a lot of changes, um, a lot of a lot of new things to learn. A lot of things were scary uh, to begin with, um, but uh, we've been able to push through. Your first year of brick and mortar ownership is uh, life changing. You learn a lot about yourself and people. Like you mm. just you think you know customers, and then you really don't, and then you do again. And it's it really is um, you know the ebb and flow of running a business, and the ups and downs and peaks and valleys are no more evident. Uh, than they are uh, in in running a traditional brick and mortar business. So um, very, very interesting, very, very interesting ride to be on. Sometimes it's fun. Sometimes it's maddening, um, yeah. but uh, but we get through it. So yeah, those are some big changes. McGrossom is also going into its most successful year as well. New clients coming on, um, new bigger projects. Um, I've been able to offer a lot more too, um, which is exciting. So I don't necessarily have to increase my knowledge or my skill set i just have to be knowledgeable enough to put the knowledgeable people around me if you know what i mean right so um in that sense um um, i'm very proud of the work that we've been doing uh, and the team that i've built i think last time we talked i didn't have anything that recognized the team um and uh, now i do and i'm really proud of that and so we just hope to grow 
and build on the strengths um, that we built so far. Amazing. Congrats on your move. Congrats you. to your partner with her business and your business. Congrats on your success with McGrossum. Can we plug the business? Like what, what kind of business is, are, you, are the two of you running? <clears throat> yeah, so it's, so it's actually a small private garage gym. L like wow. literally with a garage door that we can open up in the summertime, uh, which is a lot of fun. It used to be an old auto body shop and it's been converted into a gym. And the first owners of the gym, they owned it for about five years, wanted to step away from the business. And we were one of very few um, uh, real, um, I guess you could say buyers or prospective buyers. And, and um, so we bought the, we bought the rights to the name. We bought the place. Um, we didn't buy the actual building that's owned by the landlord, but we're a good, friendly terms with him. Um, and uh, so we own all the business rights. We own the branding, we own the name, and the name is called Iron Lodge Fitness, um, cool. is, which I think is very fitting for up north. Um, definitely like a lodge, but still that nitty gritty. It's definitely a garage gym. Um, we have um, everything you need to um, basically just beat the hell out of your body. Uh, really. it's, not <laughs> a place, it's not a place for cardio bunnies. It's definitely a bodybuilding, powerlifting type of gym. We do have those types of things for people who are looking to do cardio, but this is a place where people build up their muscles, build up their strength. Um, not to be like roided up juice heads or anything, but it is it is a, a place where you find new strength, you you, you develop new capabilities. Um, we have everyone from age like sixteen to sixty working out here, um, and uh, our classes offer a whole bunch of strength training and conditioning, HIFT and conditioning, uh, HIFT and endurance training. Uh, really the full gamut of becoming a really awesome athlete. Like what's, what's really impressive is we have like 65 year old ladies deadlifting for the first time in their life. Wow. And they're deadlifting like over like two plates. And I'm like, where you weren't doing that six months ago. <laughs> right. So it's really a, a amazing um, transformation to see our members, um, you know, no pun intended, go from strength to strength. Um, and you really see the, the glow that they have. And that's what a gym is all about. It's supposed to be turning you into the best version of yourself, right? Yeah. Spiritually, mentally, and obviously with the physical part, um, so many people feel better as they walk in and out of our doors, uh, which is amazing. And so we've been able to uh, bring on new members. And this is one of the low points. You know, you inherit a gym with sort of like a struggling client roster and it wasn't really doing well. And the old owners didn't really know what to do with it anymore. So we come in younger, more vibrant, more more piss and vinegar and um, just a, more hunger and eagerness to, to make the business thrive. And we've been able to put some really cool pieces in, in play. We brought in a whole bunch of, we spent thousands of dollars on new equipment and assets, new marketing initiatives, a whole new content strategy with me behind that, mm -hmm. which has been helpful. Um, and uh, just a whole new culture. A whole new culture has kind of evolved out of this space. Um, and it really is transformative in the community. So we're really happy about that too. But Iron Launch Fitness, if you're ever in Gravenhurst, Ontario, and you're coming up into Muskoka, um, just pass by Gravenhurst, um, pass by Iron Lodge. Drop-ins are always welcome. Uh, and we, we always welcome new people. Cool. So you have a massive advantage with being a brand designer and everything you know about personal branding and business at this point. Yeah. So when you took on this brick and mortar, I can imagine that you learned a lot when it comes to how do you build a business that is a physical business versus an online business, which you've worked with tons of. So I, I, I'm just curious more than anything, but it does fit into this conversation very well. What have you learned most about, especially when it comes to taking a struggling gym before you inherited it and transforming it using the power of branding and designing. What have you learned most when it comes to, when it comes down to this experience over the past year with Iron Lodge? Um, culture, uh, culture is incredibly huge. Um, um, you could put, um, you could have on paper, uh, the best business in the world. Um, you've ticked all the boxes, you have cash flow, you have revenue, um, you have all the bread, you have your sign and lights, you have all the parking spaces, it's all whole new paved, you have your merch, you have everything. Um, but if people don't like the experience that is going on inside those walls, they're never coming back. Uh, and, and what is even more damaging is what they'll do is not only will they never come back, they will smear you online and they'll put a whole bunch of terrible, nasty reviews online because people can do that, right? Luckily, we have not done that. The, the gym that we took over was probably suffering from a culture problem. Um, I think that there was some neglect on the part of the old owners. They were nice to us, um, but you could tell on the faces of some of our, of our members that we inherited in the early days there was a little bit of mistrust. They didn't know who these new coaches were. They didn't know who these new owners were. They couldn't really put a face or a name to us. Um, and 
I think there were some mental barriers as well that were left by the old owners of what a gym is, what it could be, what it should be, how it should treat its members. And I don't think they were having a very good time. Um, I've never really asked them that, but it's not hard to tell um, and see the looks on their faces. And again, after a, a year of working with these people, the transformation that they've gone through mentally and physically and how they just keep coming back for more, um, you know, and just the courses and the training that they go through, you know, um, I think there were a lot of injuries as well. And when you go through training and you take injury after injury after injury, it lays you low. Right. And you can't get back into the groove of things. And you're thinking, what am I doing wrong? Is this my fault? Um, and we've taken that all away uh, from our members. We've taken all the all the fear and doubt and insecurities and, un and uncertainties away from them. And we've given them a whole new fresh schedule, a whole new fresh programming, conditioning and class schedule, brought in all new equipment. We put new lights in the ceiling. Right. A new fresh coat of paint on the walls. There you go. Ah, mm -hmm. I built that website. It's still under it's still under construction and it's going through some change. We talk about website. Oh, my God, that one needs, needs a bit <laughs> of an overhaul, too. But that's basically it. Um, and it's even now it looks different from that, um, because over the over the winter break, uh, we've been um, putting a lot of uh, time and energy into it and just sprucing it up. I have plans to when all the walls are uh, flat color, like black and white, basically, we're going black and white and red accents. Uh, I'm going to do like graffiti murals on the wall and I'm actually going to paint like cool stencils and cool graffiti murals, uh, just like welcoming messages, like welcome to the lodge and be your best and things like that. So the ambiance of the space as well is very, very important. You want to feel good about the place you're coming to. It's one thing if it's your private gym in your basement, you don't care. But we're trying to offer an experience to these people. Um, and like no Starbucks is complete without its, you know, wood furniture and incandescent, you know, uh, 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 light bulbs and low hanging lights and comfy. Writing their name on furniture. the cup. Writing your name on the cup. This all yeah. adds to an experience. And that's why people go to start. If there was a Starbucks and uh, I don't know, up here in Canada, we have we have Tim Hortons. If there was a mm -hmm. Starbucks or a Dunkin Donuts or a Starbucks and Tim Hortons beside each other. Uh, you know, Starbucks pulls their uh, market share away from from the cheaper option. You can get a dollar coffee or you can get a nine dollar coffee, but it's way better over here, isn't it? Right. So, yeah. um, you know, we are competing against um, the gym is competing against a other couple of options in the town. There's uh, Crunch Fitness. There's the YMCA. Um, but we believe we offer a very specific type of experience for a very specific type of person. Um, and, uh, you know, your price points are going to be a bit more premium. Um, and that all comes into branding, too. Like what 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 a allows us to get away with, you know, in some cases, uh, triple and maybe quadruple the price of uh, the guy next door. Well, because we offer an experience that we think that you can't get anywhere else. Um, you will be your best, strongest, most vibrant self when you leave these doors um, every single time. And you'll want to come back for more and you'll be addicted to your own progress. At least that's the message that we want to put forward. And so that when you talk about branding, the way we map this back to branding is we want to take a specific position in the world. We want mm -hmm. to have our positioning perfect, right? So if there's three options in the town and people can go to A, B, or C, why would they come to C? Why would they come to us? We have a very particular position in the world that it's a, it's a flag we've planted on that hill. We're going to die on that hill. And we are pumping out messaging saying, this is who we are. This is what we think we can do for you. If these are the things that you like, if those are your values, there are values. Maybe we can vibe at the same frequency. Come to us. Maybe we can offer you something. Um, it's the same thing Starbucks does or any of all your, your favorite restaurants or any of your auto brands, right? A Honda Civic does the same thing as a BMW, but BMW owners won't go buy a Honda Civic. Yeah. It does the same thing. It moves you from A to B, but in a very different way. All gyms kind of move you. This, uh, it, they sort of move you, but in a very different way, each one of them, right? And so we think we offer um, something that no one else can offer and no one else would compete with us uh, in that arena. And so we're very proud of that. Um, and we're just looking to, to build on that as well. That is so important, everything you just said there. And for the person or the business, but not even just the business of what we're talking about, if, if you are a person inside of a company, inside of an organization, that idea of standing out Versus the competition, which could be Joe in the next department over who's going for the same role that you're going for. That idea is so powerful because the people who go and get a membership of the YMCA, 
or crunch are going to be very different than the people who get a yeah. membership at iron launch fitness. Is there yeah. overlap? Sure. But you go to sure. the YMCA and you've got 70% cardio machines, 30% weights, right? And I've only been in a couple YMCAs, but I just know that to be true from all the gyms I've been in. And you said the very first thing you said is this is a place iron launch fitness is a place you go to get strong. It's a place where you can go and the, the garage door is open. So you get the light, you get the weather, you get the, you, you get the smell of the air versus being inside a confined building. Like, it's a different vibe. And the very first thing you said about it was, this is how we're different. Because you said gym and everyone had a conceived idea in their mind of what a gym is. Right. Rows of treadmills, rows of ellipticals, some weights and TVs everywhere, right? But the very first thing you said was, this is how we're different. Well, for the person listening, how are you different than Joe? How are you different than the life coach who is sharing twice as much as you on LinkedIn. How are you different than all the other fitness coaches or whatever else it is that you do, business consultant? How are you different? How do you stand out? And what is the experience that you provide? That's powerful. Yeah, I, differentiation is huge. And I use this language all the time in the strategy that I do with my own clients. Um, there's a point in our strategy workshop and most of my clients, pretty much all of them, it doesn't matter if, they're, if they've been in business for two minutes or two years or 20 years. Um, they all come back to the same kind of strategy basics, the building blocks of their business. Um, and part of the strategy workshop that we go through together, we eventually get to this point. What are your core competencies? Uh, another way of saying that is USPs. You've, you've probably heard of that before, Brandon, where it's uh, your unique selling position. Another way of saying that is superpowers, right? Your core competencies, your USPs, your superpowers, all the same thing. Seriously, when we're talking about superheroes, what makes Superman different from everyone else? What makes Batman different from everyone else? Um, and every other superhero in, in, in you know, Marvel and DC universes, um, what makes you stand out? What makes you have fans, right? Um, what are you going to offer? What are your differentiators and your distinguishers? What are you going to offer uh, to your customers? And it might be that you want to take customers from your rival brand. What are you going to do that's different? Is it something to do with the experience they have when working with you? Is it a product or a service that, that literally no one else can get anywhere else but from you? Uh, is it price? Although I never recommend competing on price because that's a race to the bottom. Mm -hmm. And anyone who, who you know, you, you look at, you know, in my world, I'm a graphic designer at the end of the day. Am I competing with Fiverr? Mm -hmm. Hell no. Because that's a race to the bottom. It's called Fiverr for a reason. Things start at five bucks, right? I can't do anything for five dollars, right? Um, so if I compete on, on, on that metric, I'm going to lose every single time. So what are you going to do to stand out? Is it, again, the experience you offer? Is it a particular product or service they can't get anywhere else? Is it the customer service angle of it? I just feel taken care of and I feel seen and I feel heard every time I work with them or every time I buy from them, they just get me. Is it the fact that you want to be part of a brand? You want to be part of a culture? I think one of the strongest brands on earth is Gymshark, um, just because they're top of mind for me all the time. Yes, I'm a gym rat. But I could wear Under Armour, I could wear Adidas, and I do. I do wear those things, and I do wear Nike. I do wear these things all the time. Um, but Gymshark is just like next level. It is. They have said, we want the fittest, gnarliest, meanest men and women, doesn't matter. Just you are going to be shredding yourself full time. We want basically bodybuilders or would-be bodybuilders. And they have nothing but the most beautiful, exquisite models in any of their photography or videography. And they have said... You know, this is for everybody, but this is what we want you to aspire to be. That's why they yeah. put all those images out. Like we, we are an aspirational brand. We believe that everyone can be a, a friggin' power lifter or a bodybuilder or whatever. And so they make products of the highest quality to that market, right? Um, I'm sure you can get things cheaper from, from Nike or uh, Asics or from other maybe more bargain brands. Um, but that's not Gymshark's angle. Uh, they mm -hmm. want to be a premium brand and they know what they have. And, and they play heavily on culture and quality, right? And so that's what you get from Gymshark. You get a very different vibe than you would any other brand, right? Um, you could say this about cars. You could say this about coffee. You could say this about design, right? Whatever it is that you're offering, your differentiators, they got to be beaming out of your brand. Um, and that comes back to your position in the world. We want to be a more premium luxury brand. Or we want to be the uh, brand with the best experience ever. Like no one will ever wax poetic about any other brand as they do ours. Um, you know, so there's a there's a, a ton of different ways that you can map out your differentiators and what's going to be your superpowers. Um, but I think that's going to be huge. At the end of the day, too, I think it's important to remember that um, the best brands on earth aren't actually competing with their rivals. 
they're competing against themselves. And this is something since you and I have last talked, this is something that I've tapped into a lot. I don't mm -hmm. compete with any of the other designers out there, any of the other brand builders. I'm friends with them. I know exactly who they are. They're all on my LinkedIn. They're all on my Instagram. We chat mm -hmm. back and forth. I pay them compliments. This is the most beautiful logo I've ever seen. Keep it up. I don't compete with the guys in my space. I don't compete with them. I have my own clients. I'm competing with myself. And so um, every time that I put a post out, every time that I put my messaging out, every time that I'm visible and that every time I'm seen, I've made myself aware to my prospective clients eventually who could hire me or who could say yes or no to me. I've made myself aware of my presence once again to them. And they can say, oh, yeah, Nick exists. I, yeah, that's right. He does all do th those things. That's great. I'm not competing against other like top designers in the world. Um, because if I think that way, like there's a million of me out there, there's a million designers out there. I'll never eat again. Right. If, if you start thinking about your competition as, oh, they're everywhere. They're taking all my clients. I'll never get ahead. I'll never, I'll never be successful. I'll never have an edge. Well, then you're done. You're done. You're cooked. You're done. That's it. We're, we're done. How many podcasts are, are out there, Brandon, that have a similar a format, interview format that you do. And you still keep going because you think be better offers your audience something that they can't get anywhere else and you believe in this mission and you believe in what you're doing and so do i or else i wouldn't be here right <laughs> so 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 we believe together that this is offering you and i something and then a greater audience something as well um and it all comes back down to brand and maybe a culture and maybe an experience we're trying to craft for people here um i think that at some point it's great to do all the industry research and market research and figure out who's in your space and who's your competition but at some point, you push all that to the side and you say, I'm going to blaze my own trail. It's good to know what they're up to. It's good to know what they're doing. I keep one eye on my competition all the time. But at some point, I'm just going to be myself and blaze my own trail yeah. and build a brand that I think is for my clients and is for my customers. Um, I put a post out recently. Um, um, there's an old saying about strategy. Uh, there's good strategy. Uh, there's great strategy. And then there's whatever the fuck Ferrari is doing. Because Ferrari has never cared for one second in their in their existence what other car manufacturers or automakers are doing. They don't care what Lamborghini is doing. If anything, Lamborghini w was born to compete with Ferrari because the guy who built Lamborghini didn't like the way they were doing things. So he became the upstart to compete with Enzo Ferrari. Um, Ferrari doesn't care about what Aston Martin, what Lamborghini, um, what Rolls Royce, what any of those other huge luxury brands are doing. You think they care? You think they spend one second of their time? What are the German automakers doing? No, they don't care because wow. they're Ferrari and they are setting the standard and they are setting uh, uh, the, the way that this industry is going to continue to be, right? And they understand not every, not every person in the world is going to afford them. They are the premium, premium creme de la creme of everyone wants a Ferrari in their, in their garage, right? Everyone wants a Ferrari in their driveway yeah. um, and not everyone can afford them. And that's fine. If they sell, if, if the Toronto Ferrari dealership that's downtown Toronto sells one car a quarter, one car a year, that's fine. Because yeah. each car is worth like $2 million, mm -hmm. right? And so they're not going to be churning out volume like Honda dealerships where it's just like 10 Civics a day or 10 CRVs a day, right? Or four dealerships which can just sell trucks by the boatload right? Or Ram or whatever. They know they have a particular distinguished customer and they don't care. They don't care what everyone else is doing. They have a mission. They have a path and a plan and strategy, and this is what they're going to stick to. And they, at the end of the day, are Ferrari, right? Yeah. Everyone wants to be like them. Everyone wants to have them. Of course you do, right? So yeah, they 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 know what their superpowers are. They know who, who they're speaking to and they know the position they want to take. And if the day ever comes where they abandon that plan where they say, this is the discount Ferrari. You can get it for 150 mm. grand. Exactly. That's what would happen. They would break their brand in half. It would be mm -hmm. broken over their leg and no one would buy from them again. If anything, they want to keep going up. They want to say, this is a Ferrari that none of you will ever afford. And all the rich guys go, no, okay, stand, hold my beer. We'll see yes. who's, I'll sell my yacht if I have to go get one of those. Right. <laughs> and so they just keep reaching for the moon. Right. I'm not saying that's the best strategy for you or I or for anyone listening or watching this. I'm not saying that's the best strategy. That's a strategy. Right. And there's plenty of other premium brands out there. Louis Vuitton, Chanel, lots of other upscale premium brands out there. Luxury vacation experiences, things like that, that set themselves apart because they have a particular um, you know, a uh, discerning customer that they want to tap into. Nice. Um, and it's the same thing for design. You can find the cream of the crop top end, you know, $50,000 logo design uh, solution. Is that right for you? It may not be right, yes. but it is right for some customers out there. Right. So it all depends on who it is you want to be working with, 
who you've identified your clients to be out there, um, who your ideal customers are, um, and then building a brand around them, right? Speaking directly to them, their problems, their solutions. What can you do to ease their life today? What sort of solutions are you going to provide to them today? In my world, it's like visual and experience. It could be a tool or a vacuum or something like that um, that does better than anything else. You know, what are what are what are the challenges and obstacles that your customer that you've identified just can't get through today without your help, without your product, without your service or without your knowledge. Um, and, you know, building a brand around that, taking that position, say, we've decided we're going to help you guys and no one else. Maybe we'll help more people in the future. But right now, mm -hmm. this is the solution we think we can craft for you. Uh, and that's uh, just some of the strongest advice I could give anybody. We want to map out position. We want to map out messaging. But before that, we want to understand who this is for. At the end of the day, you don't build a brand for anyone else. Going back to Ferrari's example, you think they're building cars for themselves? No, they're building cars for a particular high profile customer out there um, who wants the most amazing driving experience ever known to human beings. Right. Yeah. Um, and so that's who they built their brand for. <sighs> Guys rewind five minutes <laughs> and listen to that over and over and over again, especially if you are that, if, if you're a business, great, rewind it and listen to it too. But if you are that personal brand, if you are that solopreneur, rewind and listen to it over and over and over again, you, what you said, and speaking to the Ferrari story, Price is the last thing that they're speaking about at that dealership. They're not talking about it. It's at the very, very, very end where they literally and they probably ashamedly, you know, pass over the piece of paper saying, All right, now it's time to collect the money. That's one percent of the process, right? They're not thinking about the money. You walk into a Honda dealership, the very first thing most of the consumers there and the salespeople are thinking is, What price am I gonna sell this car for? When yeah. you're selling that Ferrari, it's more of a ritual or a ceremony than a sale. Mm -hmm. And it's about that experience. And it's for that very specific type of person who probably doesn't have to sell the yacht to buy it. They just, that's, they have this thing where they're like, I'm going to get myself a new Ferrari every year or two years or three years or a new model comes out that I want. So it's, it's that ritual experience of making someone feel very special when they come in very akin to what you mentioned with the Starbucks story. And it reminds me of what I did in my business in recent years. I would work with companies as, uh, you know, every year or every two years, I would go back and I'd give a talk or a presentation and be a keynote, it'd be a workshop, whatever it was. And it would be great. They'd have a good time. I'd have a good time. They'd get results. And then I'd come back the next year or two years. I went from that low ticket price and that one time experience to I'm going to work with you for the year. It's going to involve this many workshops. I'm going to help you implement what we talk about. You're going to see these results over this calendar year. This is specifically what's going to happen. I'm going to take care of everything for you. And there's one big price tag on it right? But they heard everything that you're doing for them. They heard the experience that you're offering that not, not many other consultants or coaches or Dale Carnegie or whoever would offer. So it's that premium service versus the Fiverr experience of a la carte. I want this. I want that. It's cheap. It's inexpensive. You're providing that luxury, luxury experience. And you said, I'm not saying to do that, but I'm personally saying if you are a coach out there, if you're a solopreneur, if you are exchanging still your time for money, why not work with five clients at a luxury or maybe even why not work with two clients at a luxury premium price rather than work with, I, I sat down and had a networking conversation with a great individual uh, about a couple months ago. And I said, how many clients are you looking to take on at once? And he said, Oh, I'm looking to get 30 clients on it once. And I've got 13 oh. now. I heard 30 and that's exactly what I said audibly out loud. And he's like, I didn't mean to offend him. I don't think I did, but he was like, what, what was that for? It's like, dude, 30 people. Like I have trouble like keeping up with my family and, you know, right. texting my friends. Like how can I have 30 clients when I have five clients, Nick, I'm like, Whoa, I'm bogged down. I got to reduce yeah. this workload so I can give more to the smaller amount of clients. So we talked about number one, his pricing, number two, what he's offering. It was a lot of a la carte things and he loves what he does. Right. So that, that helps him for sure. But again, then you, you have a job right? A job that you love, but again, you're going to overextend yourself. That's where burnout comes from. And that's why a lot of small businesses aren't sticking around for the long term. So I would say for those individuals, ask yourself, how could I create a luxury experience, which is the same as a luxury product? How can I package that? Yeah. And like, my question to you is like, uh, is there a lot of coaches uh, that, that in, uh, follow this? And, and do you believe that, that uh, a bulk of your audience are 
probably in that niche because we're talking about kind of coaches now. That's true. Um, is yeah. that is that is that sort of like the bulk of your audience of this show? I would say those listening are mostly wondering and asking the question, how can I enhance my personal brand okay. using these strategies? So yeah, we did kind of go that direction, but I think at the same time, the Starbucks principle, the Ferrari principle, the luxury principle, that still applies to those people. Yeah, and 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 it's not to say that uh, just jack up your prices and the right people will come. That's mm-hmm. not what we're saying at all um, because that's a quick way to, to drive a sword through your business actually. Um, I think that um, I think that uh, you, you need to you need to build a business um, and an operation um, that one is the type and scope and scale of business that you want um, and that vibes with you and your identity. Uh, maybe you are the craftsman like me. I've built a team around me at this point that can do the work um, and I can continue to remove myself out of McGraw's and continue to give more to my team and delegate and still maybe do the sales and sign the clients on and pass that on to my account manager and my team and delegate. But I'm still the craftsman at heart and I still want to make, I still want to be a maker. So I'm the one building the brands and I'm the one taking the lead design role and building the logos. After that, once that gets approved, I ship that off to my team because I don't want to be doing any of the web work anymore. I don't want to be doing any of the copywriting. I did all that. I'm done with that. So I have carved out a little position for myself, my own business of what I want to be doing, what I don't want to be doing. And yes, if I have to pay these people money to do those services, then I have to price my services at a certain point. There's got to be a range where we're all going to eat and the client is still happy with that. And when I present those findings back to the client and the way I present myself in the world through my content, through my messaging and through my media and all that, people are saying, oh, I get to work one on one with him and he doesn't seem like some fly by night, you know, discount offering. I guess I'm going to be getting like a premium, pretty professional person and team at my disposal. By the time they jump on the call with me, like, listen, I, I don't have time for this, Nick. I'm just going to get right to it. Uh, I'm done searching on Google. I'm done searching on Fiverr and Upwork. I just want something done right. I understand I'm, whatever price you give me is probably what I'm willing to pay. Let's just talk about it now. And so they know when they pay in that range, they're like, yep, that's pretty much what I figured. How do we get started? Right. And so the 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 way you project your brand, if you're a personal brand, and McGrossom is kind of doing double duty right now. It, it is me. I am the brand. There's no beginning and end to Nick. There's like no end to Nick and beginning of McGrossom. Like they are kind of one and <laughs> the same. But uh, I'm still projecting valuable information, super potent um, stuff that people can take away. If they never hired me, the stuff I tell them online through my content, social media is still very helpful. Um, and they can apply that to their own businesses. Probably similar to what we're doing here, really. Uh, they'll be able to take this away and apply it to their own systems and processes and, and business. But I've basically carved out a little position for me in the world. And these are the types of clients I want to be work. Will I work with more discerning, bigger budget clients? Sure. But but they're probably look there's a there's a point at which my prices would turn them off because they're too low. Mm, right. And there's there's clients out there already thinking we're looking for a hundred to hundred and fifty thousand dollar solution. Let's go and find that. And I've been on calls with people and they'll never tell me this. But I've been on calls with people and you can tell they're still shopping around. They're like, yeah, you're like the third person we're talking to. We just want to get an idea. And I know for a fact, like when we got off that call, they were, they were looking for a more expensive solution because they just believe more expensive is more peace of mind. More expensive is everything is done right. A bigger in-house solution. And so when you pay a big design house, uh, like an agency, like in Chicago or New York or Toronto, and the price takes 45, 55,000, you already know you're paying for overhead, but you've accepted that. Those clients have accepted they're paying for a big team, they're paying for rent, they're paying for that agency to keep the lights on. And maybe the solution was only 20, 25 grand, but they're gonna have to pay the 45 grand because they know they're paying for overhead, but that's okay because they locked in that agency and that's the agency that's gonna provide all the solutions. And if anything goes wrong, they gotta go fix it, right? That agency has to go fix it. So there's a lot of discerning people out there who will pay much, much more, even if it's filler, even if it's not tangible and they can't really know where their, where their money is going to. And those clients aren't for me. I have a particular price point that I'm working with right now. Um, and those clients are abundant for me right now. I know where they are uh, and I know what their, their, their challenges are too. And I know how to serve that, that group of clients. Maybe as we grow, we get bigger, but then you're going to have to also kind of leave the little guy behind. And I started with the little guy. The little guy is, is what helped grow McGraw's in the beginning. And it's not, I don't have any more respect for them. We've outgrown them. And that's a normal 
that is a normal thing to happen. You will outgrow things. You will not be the same person or same business owner that you were five years ago. You're growing and growing. And so maybe things have to morph and things have to change. Um, and uh, yeah, I just think that there's, if you, if you carve out a strategy around your ideal customer and who you want to be working with, uh, and then you map your brand values around that and you, and you, and you plant a position in the ground and say, this is who we're going to work with. This is how we're going to work with them. And this is why we think it's important. And then you can carve out what your position and all of that is too. It's a lot of deep thinking, Brandon. Like there's no, there's no way, there's no way to, there's no, there's no getting out of the hard work. This is yeah. thinking, this is using your heart and your head a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of sleepless nights that I have not, how am I going to get all this work done? It's more existential. Like, who do I want to be? How do I want to um, surface in this world? Like, how do I want to project myself in this world? What do I want McGrossum to stand for? And do other people vibe at, at that same frequency? Like if my values are energy, transparency, um, and passion, if those are my values, relationships are part of my values too. If those are my values, who else likes that? Because yeah. I know my brand turns a lot of people off and they don't want to work with me. But there's a whole bunch more who said, yes, we, we, whatever you are, we want that. Yeah. Right. So I have my people. I found my people. I found a culture that I'm building here. And so you have to sit with yourself and really, this has been like three years in the making, Brandon. This isn't like something I figured out over a weekend. It mm -hmm. took long, punishing. I don't want to make it sound like it's not sexy, but like it is hard to sit with oh, yourself yeah. and, and just sit with yourself and go, if I could build anything and I can, I don't need permission. The world has already given me permission by allowing me to be here and breathe air. The world has said, you can do whatever you want. This is your time on earth. What would that look like? You're going to go build the pyramids or are you going to just sit in your little box and do nothing? Right. True. And so you're, we're all allowed to build whatever we want. We're all allowed to go do whatever we want. What would that look like? Are you going to leave the world in a, in a better place than you left it in? Because I think I'm not saving lives. I'm not exactly stitching human beings back together, but um I think the work I'm doing is meaningful. I think the oh, work yeah. you and I both do is meaningful. I think it helps a lot of people. I think you're and saving lives. Look at what you're doing with the gym, brother. That's that's saving that's, lives. That 65-year-old woman who just started deadlifting, she might have extended her life 10 years because she's got two plates on each side of that of that bar. Well, and and that's exactly it. And she and she's the first one that would tell us that I just want to spend time with my grandkids. I want to run around with them. I don't want to be out of breath chasing them up the stairs. And she's not anymore. And we've given we've sort of wow. given her her life back. Um <sighs> This is a woman who a year ago wouldn't have said, I'm building a home gym and I have all my plates because you taught me how to do that. I'm like, you're building a home gym. Oh yeah. And I'm building one in our other home in New Brunswick because we have our, our summer home out there. I'm like, I don't have a home gym because I don't even, cause I have the gym now, but like you have two home gyms and this gym, you got more gyms than I do. Right. So, um, <laughs> it's grandma. exactly. It's incredible. And, 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 um, you know, you know, that, that type of, that type of experience that we've offered that person is very, very meaningful to them. And, and they don't want to give that up, right? Because they found something in themselves. Um, and I think, so that's, I think that's very powerful. meaningful what you're saying right there, because what you said, you, you said it very quickly and I want to go back to it. You can choose to leave the world in a better place than, than, than yeah. where you found it, or you can choose to not do that and to do nothing. And you know what? you won't be judged either way for it because you'll surround yourself with other people who were doing one or the other thing, right? Yeah. It's just a different choice. But I think if you do want to leave the world in a better place, this is very existential, a lot of what we're talking about, but very practical at the same time. But it can be simplified by saying there is a problem in your company and with, with your clients that you work with. There is a problem in the world that you are equipped based on what makes you different and based on what you called your core competencies or your superpowers that you can create something in order to solve that problem. And how would you feel if you did leave the world in a better position? How do you feel when you do help grandma lift more and spend more time with her grandkids? How do you feel when you are able to create a better culture for the team that you are a leader of where you are? How do you feel when you're able to not just sell a service to a client, but change that client's way of thinking or help them improve their health or help them save money so that they can serve more of their clients or whatever it might be? How does it feel to actually make a positive difference in the world? And I think it comes down to as simple as it can be, solve a problem, 
create a package to solve that problem and yeah. present that package to solve the problem. But don't just do that. Start doing it. Even if your manager says, no, we, we can't move you into that role, Nick. Or even if your client says, you know, we, we can't bring you on at this time because of this, this, and this start doing it anyway. And the best way to start doing that is what you're amazing at right now, which is you've always been, but you've gotten so much even better. Just your content, Nick is so good. And I, let me tell you, and this is complete honesty. I do not laugh at other people's content on LinkedIn. I laugh at yours. Yours is the only one that I laugh at because it's always like the sticky note on the screen or a real conversation that you had. And you kind of, you replay that conversation as you're talking to yourself and you got subtitles, like you're funny, man. And you named your values earlier, like transparency and energy. And, and that is completely you and passion, completely you humor is in there. And I think that could be synonymous with energy, but not always humor is in there. So guys, you got to go check out Nick's page. Links are in the description, his LinkedIn, he's constantly posting. You get an idea of how he personally brands himself and incorporates these values. But let me ask you this, Nick, if you're talking to the personal brand out there, the person listening, who's like, I want to make a name for myself in my own personal space. And I know that I need to start using social media in order to make this happen. How would you, if you had to give three steps to put you on the spot here, where would you start in helping that person to brand themselves in 2023 in a more powerful way? Um, I want to, to tell them something that won't be a massive barrier and I want them to do something um, because I can sit here and start saying, well, you got to identify your ideal customer avatar and this is how you do that. It's a lot of writing and no one will do that, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's kind of like the gym thing. It's like, how do I get in shape? Well, you got to lose all the weight and then you got to start eating more and then you got to sleep better. You're like, oh, I don't want to do any of that. That's why I'm 200 pounds overweight because I don't do any of that. <laughs> and so you just add more obstacles to their life. You make it you you make it as hard as their life is right now. So I want to leave this with something, with something easy. And it sure. might sound flippant and it might sound like, well, that's not that's not advice at all. That's garbage. Um, Gary V is very good at this and he'll tell any young would be content creator and he'll tell any, and I like him so much because Gary V is such a shiny example of like, I've never seen him sell anything. I've been following him for like four years now, like pre pandemic. And I don't think I've seen a post yet. Like, I mean, an organic post, like a social media post, like, like a reel or a TikTok or whatever. I don't think I've seen him say, you got to buy this thing. I'm endorsing it. This is why I believe in it. And I think it's for you. I've never seen him sell. I've never seen him go link in the bio. At least I haven't seen him. And he puts out 10 posts a day. So I feel like I see a whole shotgun gamut of Gary Vee all the time. I think he's in all of our feeds if we follow him. This guy only talks to uh, entrepreneurs or entrepreneurial minded people, a lot of young people, he, he, he tries to destroy and demystify their beliefs around content, who they are. And he talks a lot about existential stuff too. And, and, and they ask him that question, Brandon, they go, what, what advice would you say for someone who hasn't started yet? Just start, just please just start. Cause I had no plan and I had no strategy when I started doing this either. And I'm kind of the guy who builds strategies and plans with people now. <laughs> and I didn't have a strategy or plan. Um, but you got to do a bunch of the garbage to figure out what you're good at and what and what you want to be doing, right? And so you talk about my funny, like where all my characters show up, my LinkedIn and my Facebook and my strategy characters. And I got a good Star Wars one coming out on May the 4th. I know this will air well after that, <laughs> but it's a good one where I have Star Wars characters talking to me too. So I won't spoil anything after that. But um, cool. but um, but yeah, I just I just what I try to do with my content is I try to show how hard it is to brand yourself and how hard it is to market. Right. So I bring in my strategy character and I bring in my marketing character and I bring in my design character, or I bring in all the social media uh, channels as, as, a, as me, as an avatar of that, I'm like Facebook, what, what can you tell me today? LinkedIn, what do you got? TikTok, how can we market? And it's hard and it's hard. And what I'm trying to show people is that you're not kind of alone. And even as a guy who knows these platforms and uses them, like it's hard, it's hard to like, build something big on LinkedIn and TikTok at the same time. And you got to kind of know what platform and where your audience is because the business minded people who get stuff done type of people on LinkedIn are not the same crowd that are on TikTok or reels. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so um, I would say just start, do what you feel comfortable with. Now you don't always have to show your face, but if we're talking about people who want to show their face, be on camera, um, you need nothing but your phone. I use a phone 
a $40 tripod and I have a ring light. I think everyone at this point has a ring light. It doesn't take a lot of money. I don't use a, a fancy SLR camera. I have a point and shoot. And that's another thing, Brandon, too. Last year, I talked to my coach and I said, I want to do YouTube. I want to do YouTube. I want to do YouTube. I see all these YouTube personalities. They're making tons of money. Their videos get somewhere between 50 and 500,000 views. I want that. I want 500,000 to a million subscribers. I want to be the YouTube guy. I have something to say. I can, there's nobody in my space. I actually identified this. All those awesome designers I'm talking about, none of them are on YouTube. They're on mm -hmm. the organic social media. They're on Reels and Facebook and LinkedIn and all that. But none of them are doing like long horizontal style YouTube videos talking about this stuff. I could enter that kind of space and show my work and all that. It is hard <laughs> to do oh, YouTube. Yeah. It is a full-time job. We're talking about, first of all, writing the scripts, having a good space because it needs to be visual. Like your space that you're in now, it has to be visually pleasing. Um, there's audio gain that you have to worry about. Video has to be good. Then you have to hire an editor because there's no way you're editing all this stuff because you don't want to. Trust me, it's a nightmare. You want to pass all that off. Then you have to have a strategy for scheduling. All this hashtag research, promoting the video. Each video you make, if it's 20 minutes, you got to take bite-sized clips out of them. Yep. Good Lord. It's like a friggin' full-time job. It's a circus to be good at YouTube. You would dedicate all your time to YouTube. And I realized I might have the personality for it, Brandon, but I don't have the capacity. So I gave up on YouTube. That wasn't right for me. And I figured that out. I was, I was three videos in. None of them ever got to YouTube. I'm like, this is too hard. I'd rather go back to what I know and what I'm comfortable with. And some people don't want to do the bite-sized stuff. They want to do the more meaningful bigger kind of uh, stuff, but I'm good at the bite size stuff. I'm good at the humor, like you talked about, and I'm good at relating to people um, and making them kind of feel seen and heard because all the comments I get on these videos that you're talking about, like, yes, me too. I yeah. totally, yes, exactly me. I'm like, yeah, I know. I'm not the only one. Um, <laughs> the comments so, are great. Yeah. So, so I, I would recommend people just start um, do a little bit of research on the platform that you think is best. If you really vibe with LinkedIn, go with that. If you think it's Facebook, if you think it's Instagram, um, I'm not going to sit here and say, well, there's no growth there. And that's really hard to just start, just start because even if it's all chaff at the end of the day, like a lot of the content that you see now, Brandon is really slick and tight and nice for me. A year ago, it was a little bit more rough and not as nicely polished. And a year from now in 2024, my 2023 stuff won't look as good and it won't sound as good. It'll improve over time. So you got to keep going. You got to get through the chaff to separate that from the wheat, yeah. right? And you got to know what you're good at. And after six months, you might say, you know what? I don't like TikTok. I don't want to be there. Or I don't like this platform or that platform. In fact, where I need to be is here. I found my people, mm -hmm. right? There's going to be no me telling you what's good for you. There's going to be no anyone else you can do the strategy and you can do all the binary stuff and you can map it out. But a lot of people just like that to understand the knowledge. How many times have you read a book and you're like, yes, I will commit that knowledge to my brain. I will apply those things later in life. And you never do. Of or you course. take a course, you take a 40 minute course that you paid 10 bucks on. You're like, yes, all of those things, all those things are good. And then we go away and we have lunch. Yeah. And we never apply and what we learned in that course just now. Gone. Right. These are I can make I can make all the content I want till the cows come home, Brandon, where it's like, here's three things you want to do to build your brand right now. Listen up. And no <laughs> one's going to do them. There's that YouTube personality right there. Right. That's that. There it is. And now my <laughs> camera's out of focus. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> um, so so I would say just start. Just start. You don't necessarily have to have a battle plan. There are things you can do to improve the situation. Stability on your phone. All you need is your phone. Our phones are super powerful now. All you need is your phone. Um, a tripod would help. These are things you can get on Amazon. You can do this through through the computer if you want. You have a cheap little webcam like I have, a $40 uh, mic like like you might have a little bit more expensive, either a Rode or At whatever like that. I didn't. It was a phone. In the beginning, you didn't, right? So yeah. you had to figure that out to get. That's a good. You're a great example of this, Brandon. You had to do all that crap to get to where you are now. Be better wouldn't have. You didn't start with this the glowing no. sign behind you and all this mic and, and the nice painted wall behind you. You had to get to that because you might have done two or three of these things. You're like, you know what? I I don't want to be a podcast host. This is yeah. garbage. I hate this life. Yeah. Right. And so you need to figure out a little bit in the beginning where you vibe. And if it's too much for you after just a one minute video. Yeah, uh, maybe this content thing isn't for you. And maybe there's another way we can build out your messaging and content advertising for you. So mm -hmm. I would say just start, um, uh, take a look at others in your space, what they're doing, how they're handling it um, and uh, what platforms they've chosen to be on. Because I'm telling you right now, they're not everywhere. They've decided to be in places A, B and C and they're ignoring D. Um, and that might be for a good reason. So you might be able to glean some information, not, not mimic it but glean some information, um, 
some research is helpful, but I don't want you to research forever because then you won't do anything. And I know that's true. Yeah. So I'm not going to sit here and say, build a strategy. You have to have a plan. You have to have systems and processes. All that's good. All that's great. And I'm a logistical, per like I'm a logical person. I like to know what my ROI is, where my time's going. I like to measure my time a lot, but there's something to be said for diving into the deep end yeah. um, and just, just going for a swim. Um, and, um, I'm glad I did that. Um, it's a little scary. It's still scary every day. Is this content yeah. going to kick off? I don't worry about that. I just try to be me, try to live by my values. I know my audience likes my values too. And that's it. So, um, so that would be my best advice. I know you asked for three points, but I think if you great. can't even start with the first one of just doing it and just trying it points, two and three are very points. Two and three are about, you know, learning, building a strategy, um, you know, writing out what you believe you want to be. What, what could I leave behind in this world? What would I be remembered for? How, who do I want to help? Who's the people that I think um, are in the most amount of pain that at least I can apply my skills to? Like, there's a lot of people, like, there's a lot of people who need daycare and, and need babysitting stuff. I don't know how to help those people. There's a lot of people who uh, their car's broken down and they need to fix it right now. I don't know how to help those people. But I do know that there's a lot of people with broken messaging um, don't have enough customers coming in the door because they don't have enough visibility. Their website sucks. Uh, they have no identity and they've never put out a piece of content. Okay. Mm -hmm. I can help those people. Right. And so I have a particular set of skills that I can apply to them. So um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry too much about, do I have this content thing right or wrong? It's whether it exists or not. True. Um, right. And so you have to do a lot of the crap to get to the good. And eventually you will be a spear tip for your own brand. Um, and I think, I think people who are smarter than you and I, Brandon, like Gary Vee and the like, they'll say the same thing. They'll say the same thing. Evan Carmichael, who's my friend here in Toronto, um, content machine. He'd oh, say yeah. the same thing. Yeah. He'd say the same thing. So, um, yeah, I think that would be the best advice I can give. Uh, not just because I'm parroting what the other guys are, are saying, but because I actually live that I believe in it. And, um, I have content that I thought was amazing and incredible. And I got seven views on it. I'm like, okay, <laughs> not taking it down. <laughs> Um, but I got content that I didn't think would ever kick off. Like I was very real last year. I just had my sleeveless shirt on. I exposed all my tattoos. I thought it was going to be crap. I'm like, this is the most unprofessional thing I've ever done. And I looked into my phone and I said, uh, today was shit. Um, I hope your day wasn't shit, but my day was shit. And this is why it was shit. And entrepreneurship is hard. And no one told me I was going to have to, it was like a, this is like a seven minute video I that, I, I, didn't, that. I, that I didn't edit. I didn't even put color, like color editing in. I said I wasn't going to edit it. And I said I would put subtitles in just so you can read along. But I'm not going to edit it. And I didn't. And that stupid video got like 17,000 views, yep. more comments than I ever got throughout the entire year. Because I must have hit a nerve. I must have hit a chord with those people. And I was just me. Real. I wasn't trying to be anybody else. And so that worked. And so, you know, maybe that's enough. Right? So just try it. Just do it. Um, start now. Um, and the rest becomes a little clearer. Um, yeah. But you can be as clear as you want in the beginning on paper and you don't actually execute anything. Yes. So I think that would be probably be the best advice. You've given a lot for people to chew on, man. And uh, I, I could unpack each of those points, but that would that would take a while in itself. So I, everyone, I hope that was valuable for you. I know it was for me rather than three. Let's go deep into one point. So Nick, who do you who do you love to work with right now and how can you help them? Yeah, that's a great that's, that's a that's a, a great question. Um um, I know we're coming up on time, so I'll try to I'll try to make it as compact and impactful as possible. Um, the entrepreneur that I work with, um, uh, um, it doesn't matter. I've been telling people a lot about this, and 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 I'm I'm starting to believe it more myself. I don't care if you've been in business for two seconds or twenty years. I find the people that I talk to all have the same problem. They all want to grow, right? The the business owner who's been in business for twenty five years, and I do have some of these clients now. They come to me and they say, listen, the last year was really good. And all the 24 years before that was also very good. We've always been able to do something, but now we need to grow more. And we understand and we recognize that if we keep doing the same things, we won't grow. You can't just keep doing the same status quo and hope for different results. So we need to grow. And so the way that I can help them is through branding and marketing and a better image and a better tone of voice and better messaging and a stronger position online. I can help them clean up their social channels. I can help them look like a cohesive brand experience across all their channels. I can make their vehicle wraps look like the website, right? So we can make everything look like it's under one roof and from one universe, right? So I find even the big businesses, the business owners that I like to work with who, who 
you know, it has to be said, they have a budget. They can probably afford more because they're one of those discerning types of customers. Um, there's something for them. But even the little guy, even the, the, the one man band who maybe has been in business for two weeks, they want to start their own personal brand. There's still strategy work that we can do, right? Maybe you can't afford the, the, the thousands of dollars that would eventually be branding and website. And I'm not trying to intimidate anybody, but that's what this stuff costs. If you want quality, yeah. you know, a logo was probably going to be a couple grand if you want quality and you want a wicked logo identity system. Um, but this is the reality of it. But we can start with strategy. And that comes at a far more digestible price point, And it sets you on your path. Even if you can't work with me after that, doing it like a strategy workshop is super, super potent, very helpful. The strategy workshops that I've done with people recently, Brandon, they have to build their budget with me. So like, give me a couple months. Let me build that up. I'm like, no problem. We can put you on a payment plan, things like that. But then even the work that we do, it, it affects their photography going for it protects it, it affects their writing their copywriting how these posts show up they're like oh wow i never thought of that I, my branded photography would all look different I'm like yeah it would right so it affects everything about their brand in a positive way and so even for someone who's just starting out there's strategy work that we could do you don't have to be some big business owner in business for 20 25 years even if you're just starting out getting your feet wet there's strategy work that we can do and i'm working with a client right now she's been in business for about five years and she helps other people get their strategy clear but she can't clear up her own. It's like the cobbler's shoes never, uh, the cobbler's yeah. son never has any shoes, right? Yeah. So I'm helping her get clarity around her strategy, right? Because you always need like a thinking buddy that help, right? So there's yeah. always things we can do. It doesn't matter if you're in two seconds into business. There's always something we can do that helps you propel and, and, and cover more ground faster than you would on your own. And then for the bigger businesses, we do, you know, the same strategy, but they want to do something different. You know, how do you go from five to $10 million or 15 to 25 million? They have different goals in mind. And what does that brand look like to their customers paying them thousands of dollars? So there's always something to be done. Um, but everybody I work with always has a growth mindset. They want to grow. They want to, to put not too fine a point on it. They want to be better, right? They want to be better. They want to grow. They, they, they have ambitions and goals that they want to achieve. Um, so there's something for everybody. So, um, and it doesn't matter what industry I work with. I have landscaping clients, lawyer clients, accounting clients, um, uh, all types of uh, white collar and blue collar types of people, but they all vibe at the same frequency, um, which is that uh, they know they want to build this brand up. It's not working for some reason and they just want to grow. Yeah. I love that you help people at the beginning or whether they're more advanced. And even if you're not grabbing the logo guys, even if you're not looking for the done for you content, get Nick on a strategy call with you. It's the best thing you'll do when you invest in your success and your business's success. I know for me, when I invested in 2021, everything changed because right. I had the outside perspective. I was the cobbler. My son didn't have shoes, right? He, he will have shoes. He's going to be here in like a couple of weeks. We'll get him some shoes. But uh, <laughs> you get the point, right? When you invest, you go to that next level. So Nick, thank you, brother, for joining us. Where's the best place for people to reach out to you to have that conversation? I would say my website, uh, as you and I talked before, it's going through a bit of a rebuild. Uh, I'm still in the process of <laughs> here's what here's a perfect example, Brandon. I'm strategizing it right now and writing all these beautiful things down. I'm coming up with a plan. Has any of it been executed? No, because I'm still building it. So it takes time, right? But my website right now is still the best place to go. Uh, McGrawsome.com. It's cool. spelled the way you spell awesome. So you got to spell McGraw, but then an E. So McGrawsome.com. Yep. Um, and take a look at that. Uh, you can reach me through that contact form. If you want to talk, uh, there's a couple of ways, um, that you can kind of fill out that contact form. Tell me what it is that you're looking for. And then we can have a chat. Amazing. Links are in the description guys for mcrossom.com as well as Nick's Instagram and his other platforms too, wherever you hang out, he's down there. So I'll, I'll make sure those are there. Nick, thanks for coming back on the show, brother. Second time around tons of advice, like totally different than the first conversation yeah. and even deeper in a lot of different areas. So thank you, brother. Congrats on all of your success and your partner's success. And can't wait to see where you go, brother. Thank you, Brandon. Appreciate being here, pal. No matter whether you're in a company, you've got your own business, you're at the beginning of building your personal brand, or you are an advanced brand builder who was looking for the next level strategy to take it to the next level, this conversation was for you. I hope you took a lot away from this conversation with Nick. Again, be sure to connect with Nick on your platform of choice. The different options are down in the description below. And if you're ready to take it to the next level and get even more of this advice personalized for you from Nick himself, then be sure to start that conversation from mickgrossom.com.
www.thepodcast.com. Links are in the description. If you found even just one piece of advice or we made you smile or we gave you something to think about that will help you, then please share this show with just one other person who could use it. You're the reason the Be Better broadcast has grown the way it has to almost 300 episodes because you are the best part of the Be Better team. Thanks so much for watching and listening. And until we talk again next time, continue to be better.